Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Jury Charge in Literary. We're going to start off with some Latin and French words and then I'm going to read you your paragraph. So the words are bona fide, in toto, amicus curiae, and bon ami. Okay, here's your paragraph. Amicus curiae means a friend of the court, any person who is a bystander who can provide additional information about the case is considered an amicus curiae. Amicus curiae should not be confused with the term intervener. To perform an act in good faith without any fraud or deceit is bona fide performance. Bona fide means honest, genuine, or real. In toto means wholly or entirely. If the board of directors in toto attended the hearing, this would indicate that every member of the board of directors was at the hearing. Bon ami is a French expression meaning a good friend. Sometimes bon ami refers to one's sweetheart. Okay, moving right into some congressional record, and this is called the budget. Here we go. Ready? Mr. Speaker, I am introducing the Biennial Budgeting Act. This bill would put Congress on a two-year budget cycle and enable us to budget and get the budget under control. As members of the Budget Committee, we do not have enough time to review the budget and at the same time oversee and review existing programs and policies. We do not have enough time to go over new program proposals to evaluate their merit. There are 16,500 bills introduced during each Congress. The committee must continue to oversee existing programs, consider the extension of ongoing programs, and try to give new programs the attention they deserve, which pushes the committee to the limit of its coping abilities. Throughout last year, none of the crucial deadlines have been met. These delays are symptomatic of the time constraints that are placed on Congress each year. My bill proposes that the first year of each two-year congressional term be devoted to the formal oversight of all programs and agencies. The second year would be used for the passage of any new bills authorizing that legislation be adopted. This new approach has three important assets. First, more time can be spent overseeing current existing programs. Second, more time can be spent in creating a new budget. And third, less pressure is exerted to approve or disapprove the program proposals. This would rescue us from the up and down process we now engage in, where all too often decisions are the result of last minute panic instead of long range planning. This bill in its current form has been before the House for the past two sessions of Congress. This bill has 183 co-sponsors. We must adopt a system that enables Congress enough time to give the budget the serious attention it deserves or we will never realize the goal of getting it under control. Okay, I'm going to read an excerpt from Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. All right, here we go. Choose your battles wisely is a popular phrase in parenting, but it is equally important in living a contented life. It suggests that life is filled with opportunities to choose between making a big deal out of something or simply letting it go, realizing it doesn't really matter. If you choose your battles wisely, you'll be far more effective in winning those that are truly unimportant or truly important. Certainly, there will be times when you will want or need to argue, confront, or even fight for something you believe in. Many people, however, argue, confront, and fight over practically anything, turning their lives into a series of battles over relatively small stuff. There is so much frustration in living this type of life that you lose track of what is truly relevant. The tiniest disagreement or glitch in your plans can be made into a big deal if your goal, conscious or unconscious, is to have everything work out in your favor. In my book, this is nothing more than a prescription for unhappiness and frustration. The truth is, life is rarely exactly the way you want it to be and the other people often don't act as we would like them to do. Moment to moment, there are aspects of life that we like and others that we don't. There are always going to be people who disagree with you, people who do things differently and things that don't work out. If you fight against this principle of life, you'll spend most of your life fighting battles. 
A more peaceful way to live is to decide consciously which battles are worth fighting and which are better left off alone. If you primarily or if your primary goal isn't to have everything work out perfectly, but instead to live a relatively stress-free life, you'll find that most battles pull you away from your most tranquil feelings. Is it really important that you prove to your spouse that you are right and she is wrong or that you confront someone simply because it appears as though he or she has made a minor mistake? Does your preference of which restaurant or movie to go to matter enough to argue over it? Does a small scratch on your car really warrant a suit in a small claims court? Does the fact that your neighbor won't park his car on a different part of the street have to be discussed at your family dinner table? These and thousands of other small things are what many people spend their lives fighting about. Take a look at your own list. If it's like mine and used to be, you might want to reevaluate your priorities. If you don't want to sweat the small stuff, it's critical that you choose your battles wisely. If you do, there will come a day when you'll rarely feel the need to do battle at all. Great advice there. All right, some jury charge. Okay, ready? The plaintiff is represented by the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney conducts cases on behalf of the state or the people. The defense attorney represents the defendant. The judge, sometimes referred to as the court, administers the law in a court of justice. The seat that the judge occupies is referred to as the bench. The science or the philosophy of the law is referred to as jurisprudence. A statute is a law. When a statute is violated, the case will be presented by the prosecutor and the defense attorney. The various code books contain federal and state laws. Federal is capitalized when it is used to refer to the central government of the United States of America. Okay, and even though it says jury charge, I, I feel like that's more, you know, legal, like a legal terminology so i'm going to actually read to you some jury charge right now okay all right here we go this is general jury charge the test to be given to testimony is not merely the number of witnesses but rather the weight to which the testimony of such witness or witnesses is entitled and in determining this question of weight and credibility you have a right to and you should consider the conduct of the witnesses on the stand their manner on the stand their relation to the parties if any their degree of intelligence their interest in the case if any their bias and prejudice if any the reasonableness or unreasonableness of their statements, the opportunity for ascertaining or being correctly informed as to the matters concerning which they testify. A witness is presumed to tell the truth. This presumption, however, may be overcome by the manner in which such witness testifies as well as by other circumstances or conditions such as may be used in testing the credibility of any witness. As I have heretofore instructed you, if you are convinced that a witness has sworn falsely to a material matter and being convinced that such false testimony was not the result of mistake or inadvertence but willfully given with the design to deceive, then all of the testimony of such witness should be disregarded by you unless such testimony or any portion thereof may be supported by other testimony entitled to greater weight for other reasons and you may be convinced that the witness has testified truthfully as to the portion of his or her testimony. You should not consider any statement of an alleged fact made by counsel during the trial as evidence in the case, unless such matter is stipulated to as a fact by both sides. The only evidence that you can accept in determining the issue is that which has been produced from the witness stand 
or by stipulation of counsel for the parties of such presumptions of law as the court may give to you, bearing upon the facts in the case. All right. Got some material here on taxation. Okay. All right. Here we go. Ready? Saving on taxes involves the detailed task of record keeping. An essential element of complete tax planning is to establish a good record keeping system. Your detailed records will help you to compute your income and deductions at the end of the year and to plan for the future. With receipts accumulating during the year, there is a tendency to overlook certain items. You must have a record to present to the IRS if your return is audited. The establishment of a comprehensive record-keeping system will ensure completeness and accuracy and will also eliminate many problems at tax time. After you have collected your monthly checking account statements, segregate all the tax-related receipts and keeping one year's receipts separate from another. If your occupation involves travel, meals, or entertainment of clients, you should keep a daily computer log or journal of these expenses. If you own your own home or have other investments, such as stocks and bonds, plan your investment strategies in order to minimize gains at tax time. If you use your home as your office, you may take deductions for business-related expenses. The retention of past tax returns is important in the event you are audited. Previous tax returns may be necessary if you plan to income average. All interest and dividend statements should be retained in case you are audited. Tax records should be kept for a minimum of three years. The IRS may go back as far as three years to question a return. All right. <clears throat> Moving right into some closing statements. Okay, here we go. The court is going to instruct you that to reduce an intentional felonious homicide from the offense of murder to manslaughter upon the ground of sudden quarrel or heat of passion, the provocation must be of such character and degree as would naturally excite and arouse passion. The term heat of passion is defined for you as follows. Such passion as naturally would be aroused in the mind of an ordinarily reasonable person of average disposition in the same or similar circumstances as those in question and such as would cause him to act rashly without reflection and deliberation and from passion rather than judgment. What that instruction means is that the defendant cannot set up his own standard. If he is a quick-tempered person and there is some form of provocation that leads him to believe that self-defense is necessary, it is not his standard that we judge it by. We judge it by what an ordinarily reasonable person would do in the same situation. The court will tell you that if there was a provocation that was of a nature not calculated to naturally arouse such passion, if an unlawful killing of a human being follows such a provocation and has all the elements of murder, then the mere fact or slight or remote provocation will not reduce the offense to manslaughter. What was argued to you was that Oscar Mullen reached for the knife and suddenly he felt threatened by it. This is provocation on the part of Bruce Nixon and because of Oscar Mullen's reaction to this, there is a sudden quarrel, a heat of passion takes over. Mullen didn't premeditate and deliberate. He didn't be, or excuse me, he can't be guilty of murder. Therefore, Harley Bennett cannot be guilty of murder as an aider and abetter under these theories. It is our contention that obviously there was no heat of passion. There may have been a distinct element of fear in the mind of Oscar Mullen, but that is covered by the next instruction. Neither the emotion of fear of itself nor the emotion for revenge of itself towards others constitute the heat of passion referred to in the law. 
you can have a combination of all of them and you can have that or any one of them but the court tells you that any one or more of them meaning fear or revenge may exist in the mind of a person who acts deliberately all right Just dating my my material here So my next set of material here is on windfall profit tax. Okay, here we go. Mr. Speaker, today I want to introduce legislation that will lift an unfair and unequitable tax from the shoulders of America's 3 million crude oil royalty owners. My bill will exempt royalty owners and independent oil producers from the windfall profit tax on the first 1,500 barrels of daily production. The exemption will go into effect immediately. What is the windfall profit tax? I want to make this point clear to Congress. The windfall profit tax is not a tax on the excess profits of the large oil producing companies. The windfall profit tax is an excise tax on crude oil production. The production of domestic crude oil should not be encouraged with the countries in the Middle East in a constant state of chaos and turmoil with our neighbors to the south in various stages of revolution and with the Russian states planning to become major importers of energy, we must become self-reliant. The independent oil producers play a very important role in this nation's energy picture. They drill 85% of the wildcat wells and they account for 65% of the new oil and gas fields. The windfall profit tax will not only affect the large oil producing companies, but will also place an unreasonable burden on our more than 3 million royalty owners. To give you an example, consider this. A royalty owner receives $10.75 on a barrel of oil, selling for $8, or excuse me, selling for $80. With the imposition of the windfall profit tax, the royalty owners will pay $4.42 tax on this income. This tax would place an unnecessary regulatory burden on the oil industry. In addition, the cost of complying are enormous. Mr. Speaker, the people are tired of overtaxation, overregulation, and excessive control of the private sector. Let Congress act now to answer the will of the people and eliminate this unnecessary tax. Jury charge. And this subject is plea for a verdict of not guilty. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, at this time prior to my summation, may I say first that I want to thank Judge Miller for his kindness and his courtesy. I have known Judge Miller and practiced before him for 15 years or more. He is one of our finest jurists. I have always respected him and I have always known him to be fair and impartial. Any expression of respect I pay to him now is a reflection solely of the way I feel about it because he cannot help me in this case. It is up to you, the jury. Judge Miller can only instruct you as to the law in the case. I also want to pay a tribute of respect to my esteemed friends, Mr. Jacobs and Mr. Rollins. I have known Mr. Rollins for 10 years. He is a vigorous prosecutor, and as a former public defender, he was as vigorous in his defense of prisoners as he is now in their prosecution. As to Mr. Jacobs, I have known him less time, but I have the highest respect and esteem for him also. As for you, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for the time and the attention you have given to listening to this case. I want to say now, that when I questioned you, although you may not have realized it, I questioned you solely to find out if you were intelligent, reasonable human beings. I did not question you on sympathy, prejudice, or passion. I wanted to appraise your re reasoning capacity, your intelligence. That was my objective. 
I also want to say to you that if I should make certain statements that are not in evidence, I want you to know that I do so not willfully, not knowingly. Please attribute this to some misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the facts. I have lived all of my life in Pittsburgh. I was born here. My pre-legal education was in Pittsburgh. The bones of my ancestors lie here in the soil of Pittsburgh. They have, they have had one thing, and this is the love, or excuse me, they have passed on to me one thing, and this is a love of honesty. I yield to no man my passion for honesty and decency, and I hope to pass that on to my son and to my two grandsons. So if I say anything that is not in accord with the evidence, please do not attribute it to any unworthy motive. The defendant here before you now is guilty. He is as guilty as sin. He belongs in the penitentiary. I yield to no man in my respect to lawfulness, no, nor do I yield to any man in my abhorrence of violence. A violent crime has been committed and this man belongs in the penitentiary. I am not here to try to pull the wool over your eyes. I am not here trying or attempting to smooth out some incidents. This man is guilty of a crime. He is an accessory to the crime of robbery. Anything I say to you here about finding a verdict of not guilty, I want you to understand and for that reason I want you to put it to you plainly. This man is guilty of the crime of accessory after the fact of robbery. The penalty is the penitentiary and that is where he belongs. So when I tell you now to return a verdict of not guilty, it is a verdict of not guilty with the indictment as a principle. You know Jackson did not testify to vindicate the law. Jackson did not testify to preserve the good order of society. You know that he did not do that. In every instance, his testimony was prompted by his honest desire to save himself, to save himself from the long sentence that he richly deserves. However, if that testimony is not acted upon with the utmost caution, punishment may be taken away from the real culprit. I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you have listened to this case very intelligently. The state has given you its theory as to the guilt of the defendant. I have attempted to give you a theory that the defendant is innocent, which you are normally to believe. The judge will give you more instructions on that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Okay, and that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 225 class. Have a great day.